Todd joined uh, government from the private sector, brings uh, private sector energy, enthusiasm, and knowledge, and is, is just such a great example of the spirit of service that I think motivates so many people in government. So I, I want to just to start by maybe having you tell us a little bit about where you came from before you came into government and then how you've been trying to bring into what you work uh, at HHS, uh, what uh, you started doing in the private sector and how those two yeah. threads connect. Sure. Well, um, uh, I've been in government a year now. Um, and I'll say that it's been an absolutely extraordinary year uh, where I've learned a ton uh, and met so many extraordinary people. Uh, what I did before that year uh, was uh, I was a private sector entrepreneur. Uh, and so I uh, uh, built uh, healthcare and healthcare IT ventures, uh, actually one uh, for about 12 years and then co-founded a couple others um, after that, uh, which I was advising and helping. Um, and if you'd asked me two years ago uh, what the probability was of me working for the United States federal government, I would have said, what are you smoking? I mean, there's just no possible way it's going to happen. Um, but then actually what happened is one thing led to another, um, and I got a call from uh, HHS, actually an email uh, in this electronic age, an email from HHS saying, we'd like to talk to you about this job called Chief Technology Officer of HHS. And I said, okay, well, you know, it's Bill Corr. He's a deputy secretary. He's an awesome dude. I'd love to meet him. Uh, you know, but uh, I'm in California, I just had a baby, I'm incubating these private sector companies, I'm having a great time, and so, you know, I'll just basically tell them I'll, I'd be happy to help you find your CTO, but I can't be your CTO. Um, and I was expecting the CTO job to be the, the job to run all of the uh, line IT operations, uh, all the servers and all the software in HHS, and I had some really good candidates in mind for people who could do that. But then Bill said to me, actually, the job is not that. Um, the job is to be an entrepreneur in residence at HHS. I said, excuse me? <laughs> he said, no, it's actually someone who's supposed to be an internal change agent, whose only job it is is to lead large-scale change projects and tackle issues that help HHS harness the power of data and technology uh, to improve the health of the United States. I said, really? <laughs> I said, is there a job description? He said, actually, no, that's all we really have. Basically, internal change agent to lead work to help HHS harness the power of data and technology to improve health in America. We don't really know the job beyond that, but we're hoping to find someone who fits that job really well and who's really enthused about it, uh, who will then become the walking job description and institutionalize that role in government because it's, it's a non-traditional role in government. I said, really? <laughs> then I said, well, you know, t uh, 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 Bill, I'd love to take this job you know, because I feel like I've been preparing my entire life to do this, but I'll get divorced, and that would be bad. And he said, well, you know, if you're going to get divorced, you should not take this job. But why don't you go back and talk to your wife about it and see what she thinks? And I talked to my wife, who I'd put through... 12 years of building a startup, you know, which were really tough for her. And we just had a baby, which we delayed for years and years and years having. And the amazing thing was after four days of really thinking about, um, she said, you know what? If they're really creating a job like that, then it is your national obligation to take that job. And I will come back to the East Coast with you, away from my parents, uh, and spend some more time on the East Coast with you so we can do this thing together. Uh, and so the reason I'm here is because of her. Uh, and then I joined, and you know what, the thing that's incredible is, you know, I, I get calls from my private sector buddies who, you know, always speak to me in hushed tones and say, how's it going? It's like I have a condition or something, <laughs> right? How are those forms in triplicate and those steering committees to go to the bathroom? I said, dude, I don't know what you're talking about, because frankly, my experience in the, in the public sector has been basically identical to my experience in the private sector. My experience as a public sector entrepreneur has been basically identical to my experience as a private sector entrepreneur in terms of the velocity, the intensity. Uh, but if anything, actually, the, the, the issues and the stakes have risen dramatically. I mean, I always thought I was doing private sector entrepreneurship as a way to actually change the world. You know, and I'm very, very proud of the companies that I helped to start. I think they'll do a lot of good for the world. But the fact of the matter is, honestly, um, you know, the government, while it's very difficult for the government to really be a change agent, if it actually decides to be, if it decides to actually partner with the private sector to help drive change, it has the ability to affect so much more change than any company can because it's acting as an agent of the public. Right? And it's acting on a scale that's so vast and so incredible that if it decides to do something positive, working with the private sector, it can, it can engender so much positive public benefit, it just makes the mind. So just tell us about a couple of things you're doing that, that get you really excited. Yeah. Well, one of the things actually that Bill Corr used as a hook to like reel me in in the first conversation was the whole idea of uh, open health data. Um, and that should actually tell you a couple of things. First of all, um, that open health data uh, is something that the guy in charge of HHS, uh, in terms from his chief operating officer perspective, is excited about, right? So it's not some kind of geeky thing happening to the side that 
no one in the, in the, in the policymaking apparatus cares about, something that actually Bill Core cares about. Um, and, and, and B, uh, you know, we had an incredibly exciting conversation that really actually evinced to me that not just Bill, but other people at HHS were actually incredibly excited about this. And so the whole idea of open health data is literally just a page from the O'Reilly playbook. Um, and it's essentially to uh, take literally the billions of dollars a year that HHS spends accumulating data on everything from hospital readmissions to heart attack mortality to smoking rates to obesity rates, so on and so forth. Take that data which is sitting in the vaults of HHS, uh, really inaccessible, hard to find, expensive to get, and liberating it. Right, putting it online, putting it in a form that's downloadable, machine readable, usable for free without intellectual property constraint, and use it as a platform, as soil, from which a whole ecosystem of public benefit can grow. Uh, and the model that we're actually explicitly uh, copying, uh, literally down to the <laughs> individual line item tactics, is the weather. Uh, so one thing I didn't know before I joined the government was that virtually all weather data in America uh, is supplied by an agency called the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which I think probably everyone in this room knows, but I didn't know. Yeah. Um, and NOAA supplies uh, tons and tons and tons of very high quality weather data for free uh, without intellectual property constraint. Uh, but NOAA doesn't actually fund the Weather Channel. NOAA doesn't do the nightly newscast. NOAA didn't found weather.com. Uh, the private sector actually did that. And so it's a wonderful example of this public private sector symbiosis where the public sector does what really only it can do most efficiently, which is supply this data as a public good about the weather, and then the private sector turns it into all kinds of useful products and services and applications and benefit that make the public much better off and create a lot of economic value as well. So basically the whole notion of open health data at HHS uh, is to turn HHS into the NOAA of health data. Uh, yeah. Take data on community health and you know, hospital quality and drug and food and device recalls and you know, determinants of health and healthcare costs and utilization and quality and liberate that data uh, and have a whole ecosystem of private sector innovators uh, take that data and turn it into all kinds of features and products and services and applications and programs that can help the country become healthier and also create a lot of economic value as well. So you've been, you've been here for a year. Yeah. Uh, what's happened so far? What, what, what kind of successes have you seen? Oh, it's, it's, it's crazy. Um, you know, um, so uh, one example actually is uh, something we're calling the, um, uh, the Community Health Data Initiative. Um, this is something that you were instrumental in helping to start, thank you. Um, it's a whole O'Reilly formatted play. Um, and it started literally just a few months ago, March 11th, right? We pulled together a group of uh, 45 leading innovators and basically said, look, is this idea of HHS as the NOAA of health data, is it stupid, is it a good idea? And people said, well, it's a really good idea. Um, so we actually, a week later, put out a bunch of data sets uh, in an easy to find website, in an easy to use way. Uh, and then in about 82 days, um, uh, uh, people built uh, a whole bunch of applications everything from community health dashboards to online games to educate people about community health to uh, integration of hospital quality data with search online. Yeah, that, that was one of the ones that I thought was really interesting. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that Todd and I brainstormed was it isn't just a matter of a government agency uh, moving from building its own applications to getting somebody else to build applications. It might be actually feeding your data into applications that already exist. Right, no, exactly. So in this case, there was this HHS hospital compare website but now that data is actually used as part of the basis for hospital search in Bing because right. we connected with an existing service out there in the private sector. That's right. I mean, the private sector has so many different platforms and products and uh, systems of value creation already that yeah. data can be streamed into. We uh, didn't have to build a new search it. engine. You just had to yeah, connect into exactly. the ones that are out there. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, so that was really spectacular. We, we, we demoed a bunch of those apps at a big meeting with Secretary Sibelius and Deputy Secretary Core. Uh, on June 2nd, and now we're actually escalating uh, the amount of data that we're releasing uh, and uh, proliferating the number of challenges uh, that uh, variety of folks are actually launching uh, to, uh, to use this data in interesting and powerful ways. So there's a, there's a site called health2challenge.org. It's being run by a partner of ours, health2.0, uh, where uh, 11 different organizations uh, are actually uh, uh, launching challenges uh, to the innovation and developer community to build applications to everything from uh, uh, help engage kids in health data to help encourage physical activity, et cetera. Um, actually, uh, uh, I'm going to take this moment to announce uh, one of the challenges, uh, which we're actually launching today, okay. uh, which is actually the first challenge launched by HHS on this site, uh, formally. Uh, and so take our, our hospital compare, uh, nursing home compare, dialysis compare data, a whole bunch of really cool data on hospital and nursing home dialysis quality that virtually nobody knows about, <laughs> and take those data sets, and like Microsoft did with Bing, do something really cool with them that, that brings the data where people are and helps them make better decisions to help improve their, their health. Um, and so it's a really cool challenge that we're launching on uh, health2challenge.org today. 
Uh, anyone can sign up to respond to it. Um, anybody from corporations to, we're very hopeful, uh, you know, folks in their garages, uh, mm -hmm. university students at home <laughs> in their dorm room yeah. who will build something really cool. Uh, but the other point I want to make about that is that it's, it's the 11th challenge. The other 10 are not sponsored by HHS. I mean, they're right. sponsored by a lot of different private sector organizations who uh, are uh, helping to incent and activate the innovator community to build really cool apps yeah. that will help people. So uh, I think there was something else you mentioned that you work on, Blue Button. Tell me about Blue Button. Yeah, so Blue Button us. is another, um, another data liberation initiative um, that uh, we are kind of in the process of, of launching. Uh, the president actually mentioned it in a speech uh, to the uh, 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 Disabled and Veterans Association um, a few weeks ago. But it's a very simple idea. Um, uh, just as a background for the idea, two of the largest repositories of personal health data in the world are the Veterans Administration and Medicare. Uh, and they both actually have portals uh, where a vet or a um, uh, Medicare beneficiary can actually walk up to these portals, mymedicare.gov and my healthy vet, and actually sign up for an account where they can actually view their own personal health information. Uh, but the thing that was missing uh, from both of these portals was the ability to get a copy of your information uh, in a downloadable form yourself. You can then upload and transport wherever you wanted to. Um, and so Blue Button is this kind of almost embarrassingly basic idea, uh, which is to add a blue button <laughs> to each of these portals that allows you to hit it and download and get a copy in a, a flat ASCII file, uh, you know, a, a, a copy of your own data. Um, and as small and as basic as it sounds, it actually yeah. turns out to be a really big deal. Well, it's a huge deal. I, mean, I have to say, you know, just in the context of data that's collected about us on the consumer internet, it'd be great to have a blue button on Google that says, well, that's right. you know, give me all the data that you have collected about me. Well, that's right. You know? <laughs> and actually, so it's interesting, because in the private sector, it turns out that this blue button type capability doesn't really exist yeah. very much. And so what we're hoping to do, uh, which is kind of an interesting position for the government to be in, is for the government to actually trailblaze the idea of blue buttons everywhere. Right. Um, uh, so your, yeah, we'll just give you your data. Just your data, that's yeah. it. I mean, you already have the ability to see your data in a web page on a web portal, right? Uh, whether it be a government portal or a private portal. So this is just a simple step of actually adding a blue button allows you to take a copy of it, because it's your yeah. data. Yeah. It's not the government's data, it's not uh, you know, Google's data, it's your data. So give us a vision of the future. We've moved to electronic medical records, uh, they're widespread. Uh, what kind of things become possible uh, as that data is available in electronic form that aren't possible today. Oh, How does healthcare become better? Oh, just an enormous number of things. I mean, uh, it all just makes the head spin to think about them, you know. Um, and there are a lot of other things that we can't even begin to imagine that would be possible. But, uh, you know, at a very, very basic level, you know, a, a couple of things. One, um, care is incredibly fragmented today. Um, so something like 75% of Medicare costs are actually uh, expended upon something like 5% of Medicare beneficiaries who each have an average of five chronic conditions or more simultaneously and see an average of actually 14 doctors per year, right? The current health system is actually terrible at coordinating the care for those folks, and that's an extreme case. I and mean, even in a uh, less extreme case, right, there's still multiple doctors that you see, multiple hospitals or care centers or uh, loci of care that you go to, and you, it's very hard to get your providers to actually communicate with each other. Um, and so, as a result, uh, lots of tests are duplicated. Uh, you know, lots of things are important for one doctor to know aren't known uh, by that doctor. Um, and uh, your care is suboptimized. There's this incredible study, actually, that um, uh, a brilliant uh, researcher, Elizabeth McGlynn, did at RAND uh, a few years ago. And it was a very simple and brilliant study where she said, look, for acute care, preventive care, chronic care, for basically the most common things that happen to people, I'm going to tabulate the most basic things that any medical student would say you need to do for a patient in those situations, right? The most basic things you should do for a diabetic, the most basic things you should do for someone who's just had a heart attack, right? Then she and her team went and looked at thousands of paper medical records <laughs> and said, you know, okay, well, what percentage of the time did Americans actually get the most basic care that any med student would tell you that a diabetic should get or someone who had a heart attack should get? So guess what the percentage was? 15? Um, it's better than, <laughs> I probably biased your answer with the tone of my question. Um, but no, Americans basically got, for each of the major zones of care, the right care, uh, acute, preventive, uh, chronic care, the right care about half the time, yeah. right? And it wasn't because we don't have the best freaking doctors on the planet. We do, right? It's that we're practicing medicine and we're practicing uh, health management in an artisanal way. In a yeah. 19th century way, yeah. right? The, the, the process control doesn't even, I mean, the term doesn't even apply to what's really happening, honestly, in, in most of healthcare. So we've got these amazing pilots, these amazing doctors and nurses, health professionals who are flying a World War I biplane, right, through an increasingly turbulent storm. 
Um, you know, uh, and so essentially, if you have liquid information, what then enables the world to do, frankly, um, is to make information connect uh, about a particular person um, and to enable process control to happen, i.e., okay, did that person get all the care the diabetic's supposed to get, right? And once you have the information in one place that you can actually interrogate, it's relatively simple to say, okay, well, they're missing a foot exam, you know, or they're missing an eye exam or something else that they really need to get right. uh, that then doctors as a whole can be reminded to do. All right, well, I think we're out of time. I could spend another uh, half hour with you easily. But Todd, uh, you're doing amazing work at HHS. I really believe that we are on the verge of a transformation in the healthcare system and that technology can have a huge impact. And you're the man. <laughs> you're the man. <laughs> All right, Great to see thank you. you. All right, take care.